but I'm not quite sure how I feel about following on for an actress. <laughs> <laughs> but I will try and make the Coal Valley a little bit glamorous. <laughs> it's a job, but... Okay, so um, over the last couple of days, over this weekend, we've been hearing um, some really interesting talks about the archaeology of the Thames. And the Thames is, of course, an extremely important river and has been significant in shaping landscapes throughout time. But I'm not going to be talking about the Thames today. So there are and have been other rivers in London and Greater London. And as we go back further into time, there are other landscapes too. Um, and these landscapes, some of these landscapes, are fairly invisible in today's urbanised environment. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about my research, which is not Thames foreshore related. This is actually about prehistoric material on the floodplain and the terraces in the Colne Valley, West Middlesex, which to give you some context um, and a sense of where it is, this is central London, here's the Thames, we follow that through all the way up here to Staines, and this is where the River Colne meets the Thames and heads northwards up uh, as far as around Rittlesworth and Watford. So, my project focuses on people who were living in this valley from around 11,000 years ago until about uh, 4,000 years ago. So, a period of time from the early Mesolithic up until the end of the Neolithic around here. So, it's a period of about 6,000 years spanning, as I say, the Mesolithic and Neolithic. So this is a long period of time and it's very difficult to conceptualise this vast time scale on a human scale. Um, in fact, there are difficulties generally in conceptualising prehistory on a kind of smaller scale. And this is not just because of the vast time spans that we're talking about, but it's also because of what we choose to pay attention to. And we do tend, to, we do choose what we pay attention to, partly because we're human beings. We take cognitive shortcuts. We categorise, we generalise, we homogenise. And this is basically because we need ways of managing the overwhelming amount of information that we need to process about our world. So for prehistoric archaeology, this means it often becomes very generalised and similarity tends to be overplayed. Large scale patterns are inferred through typologies in material. Um, we get linear sequential chronologies. So for example, the idea that people become more and more sedentary during the Neolithic, that they gradually give up their hunter-gatherer movements and that they start building monuments, they make pottery and use land for agriculture, which they do. But um, realities of daily life would also have been on very different spectrums and scales. And these don't tend to be visible if we're only looking at bounded areas or large scale patterns. So, uh, the Colne Valley. So first of all, um, I'm going to give you a few photos of some places in the Colne Valley, um, which are starting to show some of these spectrums. So the first place, this is just outside of Uxbridge Town Centre. And the top left photograph is how this place looks now. Bottom left is how it looked during excavation in the 1980s and 1990s. And the right hand side photograph is how it might have looked um, around 9,000 years ago during the Mesolithic. And this, is, this will be recognisable to some of you. This is Three Ways Wharf. So in an audience like today, I imagine quite a few people probably will have heard of it. But if you were to ask the general person living or working in this area, um, they wouldn't have a clue. And in fact, I've just updated Google Maps with the correct location as they had it placed on a roundabout. Um, <laughs> although, to be honest, wherever you placed it, it would be incongruous because this is an outer London suburb. It's heavily utilised by businesses such as Perexil, it's urbanised, um, it's a commercial centre and it's really difficult to imagine a landscape inhabited by hunter-gatherers. But it was, um, and the whole of the Colne Valley area was a major area of occupation during both the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. 
And this time span is very well represented through both, both archaeological features and finds for this landscape. But as I say, it's not particularly visible and it's not particularly well known um, prehistoric landscape. So here again, it's another place in the Colne Valley and this one might be a bit more familiar to most people. So the top left is Heathrow Terminal 5 now, Terminal um, 5 during excavation in the 1990s, and how it might have looked in uh, around 5,000 years ago. So we're moving into the Neolithic now. This is the Neolithic landscape. And there's actually a huge amount of Neolithic material from commercial excavation around the whole of the Heathrow area. But again, I'd be really surprised if most people have much sense of this as they head off on their holidays. Um, and both Mesolithic and Neolithic life have been well recorded in the West London area. Excavations in the Heathrow area particularly have been extensive, and uh, this is primarily through governmental and commercial projects. And some of those have produced some amazing site narratives to places like Three Ways Wharf um, and Terminal 5, but which I didn't notice in our raffle which is a shame, that's a, an omission. Uh, and I think there's a few more coming out in the near future. But there is also a lot of unconnected or lost material in this landscape. Um, so residual finds that turn up in later contexts, small surface scatters of flint, or axes that, people, that turn up in people's back gardens or allotments. So for example, um, on the left, this is a polished axe from an allotment in Staines, and the right-hand side picture is a jadeite axe, which was picked up uh, on Staines Moor. And these are the sorts of things that many of us are often interested in, the finds, the loose material that works its way out of its original context. But because this material is scattered, it's not part of the larger narratives, site narratives. It doesn't get included in the story of Mesolithic hunters or Neolithic builders, particularly. It's part of a wider landscape, but it's on a more invisible scale. And so uh, some of the dense signatures that we see around um, Heathrow of Neolithic life, for instance, don't tend to get connected with movement away from the Thames. So, and yet people's daily business would have taken them in all sorts of directions and not just along the Thames. So what I'm trying to say is that Mesolithic and Neolithic histories are wrapped up in broader landscapes, and those include the Cold Valley, um, and they actually start to become a bit more visible and joined up when we start looking at the loose material as well. So where do we find it? Um, my project is initially using archaeological archives, although I might end up with some additional information once the HS2 investigations get going properly. Um, but at the moment, this is the first point of reference for my project. So um, the local historic environment records will give me a guide to all published site-based excavations, also unpublished. Um, it gives me material found as scatters through field walking, chance finds like the material that turns up in people's gardens, um, paleo-environmental records, plus it will give me um, an initial reference to uh, the map locations and also uh, more detailed contextual information and where to go for, for, for more of this contextual information. And also, um, surprising sources as well, not surprising as such, but additional extra sources, uh, particularly John Cotton, who's been a fantastic source of uh, making sure that I'm on the right track with some of this material. And I'll introduce some of it to illustrate. So this is going back to Three Ways War, which is here. So this is the Colm River Valley. So this is going up towards Watford. It follows you can see the meander of it heading down. This is Heathrow Airport here. And this area was all been low-lying floodplain. As you move over towards the east, you're going up onto higher terraces. Um, it's difficult to see the topography from these Google Earth maps, but that kind of gives you a general idea. So uh, three ways wharf, there are at least three distinct periods of occupation here, in here. And I'm interested in the one that happened just before this area became swamp and basically sealed the site for a couple of thousand years. And that was around 9,000 years ago. 
So at Three Ways Wharf, a group of about 20 people left behind enough material that we know they set up here for an extended period of time. And that was probably over the late winter and early spring. So they left behind, some of it you can see here is the animal bone. They left behind um, a dense scatter of red and roe deer, beaver, a couple of swan bones, um, fox and wolf. And some of the long bones had butchery cut marks. Some pieces were burnt at the ends, which suggests that they were trying to do things to get the marrow out of the bone. Um, they left flint tools, some of which were burnt as well. And many tools were made using bone hammers, which you can see on some of the flint tools and you can also see from chop marks on the bone. And this is an amazing site. Um, and so much that can be gleaned from this assemblage. So, for example, the species of animal tell us about the type of woodland that was off towards the east nearby. Um, the marks and the burning on the bone and the use were on the tools, etc. They tell us what sort of tasks were going on here. So we can see a group of people who were making tools and making fires. They were returning from hunting, they were cooking, they were preparing animal skins. Um, for clothing and shelter, most probably. Um, oh. oh, I'm going. Sorry. Okay. Um, but there are other aspects of these tasks that were also going on in the wider landscape. And this assemblage was found in the same sedimentary location as other scatters, both large and small, around this floodplain. So, for instance, this is Jude Wharf and Pitt, this is Boyer's Pitt. Both of these two places um, were, had flints of a similar raw material and were in the same sedimentary location as Three Ways Wharf. Um, and some of the smaller scatters also show evidence of, sorry, show the detail of the day to day. Um, for instance, this scatter here is Long Lane in Hillington, this is up on the higher terraces. Um, and this was away from the floodplain and but it's a small scatter that was probably contemporary with Three Ways Wharf, but it was not a stopping point of duration, unlike Three Ways Wharf. So this is a small scatter of about 19 flints, and it's the signature of one or two people while they were out hunting in what would have been the wooded terraces above the river floodplain. So there was a couple of flint cores that they would have picked up from the river before they set off. They would have carried it almost as a pocket toolkit. So from which there was a few pieces that were met, that were napped. They made a projectile, which was fashioned out of the core flakes. They left waste flakes behind. Um, it was basically a quick stop for making a few necessary tools for getting the fire going, having some food while they were out hunting. So the materials found here and in the wider landscape. So the sites and the wider landscape, all these materials, a part of collective movements and background activities which made and remade this landscape. And taking all these materials into the narrative addresses some of the invisibilities in, pre in this prehistoric landscape. Because the past is not just about chronological linearity. It's not just about movements and progressions forward in time. It does go sideways as well. There are things there are concurrent and overlapping movements and moments in time and get, some of these get overlooked and overshadowed by big events. So it's interesting to think what else was going on while people were making headgear or antler headgear or not at Star Car, while people were moving bluestones between Wales and the Salisbury Plain. Um, histories don't unfold sequentially. They come together through a series of players and actions with different and all of these perform with different speeds and across different spectrums. So this is not a project about finding a major discovery. Although some practices never amounted to large scale events or patterns, they've still left a trace in the archaeological record. And the extent of the material that we have at our disposal means that we don't actually have to limit what we pay attention to. So it doesn't have to be about what happened first and where. It can also be about finding stories on a human scale, stories of everyday life which come together to narrate lesser known landscapes.